What do you think is uh, that makes British hauntings unique? I think the word that really springs to mind is the word history. If you think of an M.R. James story, you know, M.R. James was writing contemporary stories to him, even though we think of them as cosy, kind of Victoriana or, uh, you know, early part of the uh, 20th century. But um, the forces, the malignant forces, are always really old. If you think of the age of America, which is, what, a few hundred years? But the forces of evil in M.R. James are hundreds, thousands. Almost ancient pagan. Ancient prehistoric forces, often kind of an intangible forces. And if you walk around a, a, a British village or town, you get history all around you, you not just uh, decades or hundreds of years history, but thousands of years history, you know, in, in, in churches, in castles, and there's this, that, that sense of history all around us. And I think there's a kind of implicit sense that history might bubble up. Right. Um, it's not gone, it's still, it's still kind of there. And if the buildings are there, what else is there? Yeah. Are, are the forces there? You know, are they kept at bay to some extent? I don't know. Well, there's this notion also that um there's a famous saying, isn't there, that there's supposed to be more ghosts per square mile. Yeah. More in Britain maybe than we're anywhere Maybe else. we've got more active imagination as well, that's the other thing. <laughs> maybe it is, maybe it is. Maybe, I mean, Britain has created this long legacy of supernatural fiction, yeah. of fiction of the fantastic. Do you think that closes in very tightly, uh, tightly together with those two things? Do you think that it's very much You mean tied people in seeing ghosts and the, the fiction of ghosts? Or almost this, this belief and this passion for the otherworldly. Do you think that's part and parcel of it as well? Or? I think it, partly ghosts come from uh, partly the idea that the wish fulfillment of things not ending with death. So in mm. putting fiction to one side, I think there's a, there's a, a, there's a craving to believe that, that things don't end when you pop off. But there's the, there's the kind of Freudian con contradiction which, which is what you wish for and the repression of the desire that you wish for. So I really want a dead person to come back, but when they come back they want to suck my blood. Right. You know, it's kind of a, the repression of the wish. You I know? want them and to I come back and help me find treasure somewhere. Yeah, well, well there's, the, there's the, the, the crime that is righted by the ghost that says, you know, I was killed in the middle of the night, this is my murderer. There's, there's all the idea of ghosts being mixed up in, in justice to a certain extent. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, what fascinates me about ghosts is that they, they are cultural phenomena in that they, they mean different things in different times. Yeah. They, can make, they can mean very different things in our time. As someone that writes about ghosts and always uses ghosts in stories, they can be metaphors of a whole pile of things. I mean, in, in Ghost Watch, I mean, the metaphor in Ghost Watch was um, your imagination coming true and be right. careful what you wish for. In Afterlife, the ghost was about, I mean, there were individual ghosts in the sub-stories, but the overall tone of Afterlife was about grief and about how you deal with, with grief. So that was the, the metaphor that was used in that. Um, to some extent, the awakening as well. The awakening is, is a little bit like Afterlife, which is the clash between your rational thought and your irrational thought, the irrational impulse to believe in ghosts and the rational impulse to say, no, I don't, that doesn't, uh, mm. that's not factually correct, you know. Yeah. And that, that, that's a nice um, dichotomy and friction because um, I think most people have those two things brushing up against each other all the time. There's, there's a, you know, there, <coughs> there's a will in your heart to think that that your spirit or your soul has some longevity beyond just this piece of meat that's going to decay. Um, and it's not strictly not rational, but, um, but I think the, why I like it is that in a ghost story, if someone sees a ghost, I think if they somehow accept it, I don't think that's a ghost story, paradoxically. I think that's a right. fantasy. So Blythe okay. Spirit, I don't think is a ghost story. The ghosts in it are ghosts, but I don't think it's a ghost story. A ghost story relies on the disbelief and the doubt of the character that sees the ghost, and possibly the fear because that's what we would be—that's what we would be like. And we wouldn't say, "Oh, you know what? I saw someone standing over there just now." We'd say, "Did I see something go yeah. over there? Am I crazy? Did I imagine it?" And, the, and it's within those questions, I think, an awful lot of stories—not an awful lot of stories come, but but for me, the psychological integrity of a of, of a ghost story comes. And also, what really fascinates me, which I know you're interested in, is the fact. That that it's mixed up with duplicity, fakery, yes. delusion, self-delusion, and I find those subjects about human beings really interesting. And belief systems, you know, and that, that's, that to me is constantly fascinating about human beings. And constantly changing belief systems as well. Yeah. You were saying about the duplicity. I mean, what do you do, for instance, if you're an expert that believes one thing, mm. 
and you're absolutely dogged about that belief that it might be a scientific belief and then something ruptures that belief. Yeah. And my experience, not of, uh, in the supernatural or paranormal arena, is that experts will always hang on to the 17 books they've already written about um, wind vortexes to explain crop circles, for instance. Yeah. They're not going to suddenly say it was Doug and Dave in a field. <laughs> they don't. They yeah. say, well, that might have been Doug and Dave, but I still think my wind yeah. vortex is... Yes, up. absolutely, you know because, because they want to hold on to the notions that back up their belief systems. Yeah. They, uh, belief systems can be so integral to someone's uh, self-worth that they can't just reject it willy-nilly, even though they, they believe in the scientific method, which is, if new things present themselves to you, I will adapt. The fact of the matter is, their opinion becomes so much part of themselves, they can't extricate it. Uh, that's a kind of clash that I find interesting. And, and, and when it gets into the area where a scientist, for their own egos, may fake something, yeah. uh, that which becomes leads, really interesting. Which leads it? very interesting in, yeah. into the, um, the idea of Harry Price yeah. and a lot of the scandals that surrounded Bawley Rectory. And yeah. the fact that on one side he was a very respected paranormal investigator, at the same time the psychical research But he was body. branded as a, as a self-publicist, wasn't yes. he? He was a larger than life. Kind of absolutely. I mean, he used to he'd be. He'd probably um, have a chat show now, wouldn't he? I think. He would. He would absolutely. It would be most haunted with Harry Price, yeah. wouldn't it? But yeah. I mean, he was. Um, he was a. Or Harry and Katie Price, maybe. Oh God! Can yeah. Imagine. <laughs> There's hell. <laughs> um, but he was. He used to be a salesman before he became a, a oh, paranormal yeah. investigator. Yeah. So he, he entered the psychical uh, research very much through the tradesman's entrance. entrance. Yeah. <laughs> so they were initially kind of going. Who's that? Oh, so there's so, a class thing going on. So there on. was a class thing going yeah, yeah. on. The fact also that he, he wasn't interested in just keeping investigations in just purely in research, that he wanted to get in there and mm. do things actually in a very modern way. Mm. But at the same time, like you say, there are suspicions because mm. he wanted it to be this phenomena mm. that he may have tampered with evidence, mm. created evidence in some point. And that, that goes back to the point that you were making, that yeah. at what point does the, the truth cease to be particularly important? And then it is purely about people falling in love with the idea of a place. And of course, investigators can perpetuate hauntings uh, or paranormal belief, can't they, just by their presence there. I was interested when I was writing Ghost Watch, you know, the, the kind of poltergeist uh, case in, in, in a kind of ordinary uh, London uh, house, uh, I was kind of interested in both the, the par paranormal investigator moving in with the family and becoming one of the family. You know, the family unit um, embraces her in a way as part of the weirdness. And then also the TV crew, which is part of the kind of uber story of, of Ghostwatch, also becomes a family. And I, I really like that idea because, of course, we do feel a, f a fami familial connection with TV characters. When we see them in the street, we feel we're... We know them almost intimately, yeah, you know. You know but, the we character. but we only see them on TV three times a week. But, but sometimes we see them more often than we do our close family, yeah. when you think about <laughs> it, per hours per week, um, which I, I found all kind of interesting. But this idea of the investigator going in and becoming part of the family with, it, with their own agenda, but it's almost, it's almost the, two, the two agendas, the family, whatever that is, be it, mm. be it psychodrama, be it fakery, be it um, attention-seeking, be it um, kind of needy in some other way or, or genuinely scared, traumatized people who don't understand what's going on. And, and uh, an outside force comes in and kind of connects with that, with their own psychology going on and their own needs maybe and attention seeking. Um, that becomes a very interesting dynamic, I think. Step 
perhaps and perhaps quite as well.